and uh, the lads will come in there. So, firstly, to introduce the three boys, if you want to turn on your <clears throat> microphones there, obviously we have a pri privacy notice at the top here, so have a read or you can click dismiss there. So, firstly, we have our own Paddy Cullum. Um, myself and Paddy soldiered together for many's a year. Um, we both keep in contact too. Anytime that either of us have any bother goalkeeping, uh, we're always the first one to pick up the phone to each other. Then we have our neighbour, uh, who we get on very well with, and the Lions, who worked with Leitrim GEA from Carrie Gallen. Um, Enda and myself would have played around the same time, and Enda's now doing a very similar job to me uh, down in Leitrim as well. So we both be dealing with each other a lot through cross border leagues and cool camps and different bits and pieces. And then we have Craig Lynch from Loud, who's also a Leinster coach, um, working up in Dundalk IT and has his own web and, or his own website there and YouTube channel, The Gaelic Goalie. We'll talk a little bit about that later. So firstly, lads, welcome. Thanks for joining me and uh, hopefully we'll have a nice evening. Um, so Paddy, I'm going to start with you. Just make sure your mic is on there, Paddy. Um, yeah. Just, yeah, great. Just want to start a little bit about your background growing up. Obviously, you're Balnamuck. Um, tell me a little bit about your family, going to school, who are you hanging out with in those early days? Yeah, so um, I went to school in Ballinamuck National School. Uh, it's, it's only about five minutes away from my house. Trimish one is only probably about five minutes the far side, but Ballinamuck was easier with the bus going by. Um, my family does myself. Uh, I'm the youngest. I have a brother, he's the oldest, and then the sister in the middle, um, mum and dad as well. All um, living around home still, so we're all fairly close. Um, going to school... Um, I had one of the bigger classes in Ballinamuck. There was, I think there was 12 or 13 in it, but there was, there was some small ones as well. But it's probably a small class looking looking at the ones now it is. Um, I would have hung around with a load of lads that, basically lads that played football. It, it was just the way it, it all fell in. Um, got to know then, obviously, when the, the, we finished up in school, when the two when the two national schools came together. So the Drumlish lads and the Ballinamuck lads, I started to get friendly with them as well. So I would have been hanging around with both from Drumlish and Ballinamuck over the years. And in those early days, Paddy, in like say first and second class and you're really finding your feet around the yard and the bit of a pitch there beside the school, what games were you playing? What were you interested in? Oh, uh, when we were in school, Damien, it would have been a big soccer, soccer games. I, there was a little patch of grass there just beside the fifth and sixth room that we were only allowed on because we couldn't get to the big field until we were in fifth and sixth. And we used to be doing headers and volleys and playing a small bit of Gaelic football, but the the main the main one was crossing the ball in for cross for for headers and trying to get the keeper to come out and all that. So it was every man f fending for themselves. It was basically just the battlefield. And had Paddy any interest in playing between the sticks at that stage, or was it whoever scored went in? It was kind of whoever scored went in, and there was a lot of lads that probably were trying not to score in at that stage. But um, no, probably not at that. I played a little bit in school, boy, but it never really dawned on me at that stage that I was going to probably make it or try and make it as in the goals anyway. And then, Paddy, moving on into school by football, <clears throat> into the upper room, when did you start playing there? Were you third or fourth class or were you a little bit later? It would have been probably third class, but mainly started probably on the team, maybe around fourth class and that. And I would have been a sub coming on, maybe out the field most of the time. I think when I got to fifth class or sixth class, I ended up going in goals in a county final or a division three final, whatever it was against Mullinyakta. I then in the park at half time. So I played out the field at the start and went in the goals in the second half. And um, there's a lot of height in your family, Paddy. So you were quite tall at an early age. Were you growing into your body or was that a, a sort of a challenge at a, at a young age? That was a challenge, Damien, at a young age. Um, <laughs> the body would have been a bit bigger now than the height at the time. So I had, I had a good bit of growing in to do at that time. But I, uh, yeah, the height the height is on really on my dad's side, like so myself, my father and the brother were all over six foot, like so but I finally grew into my body and yeah. Yeah, and that can be a real challenge as you know, as a kid that's tall and you know, maybe a bit gangly and awkward and that sort of stuff, and trying to make their way in sport. Um how did you find that early doors? Like obviously you had a keen interest in it, but you know, maybe not nailing your place down on a team or whatever. Yeah, like I probably would, I would have found it hard enough in in national school, but it was more when I got to secondary school that I came out with Michelle and I got more confident in myself and say so started to train a little bit harder and started to lose a bit of weight and started finding my feet a little bit more. So um, 
probably probably around when I got to mind that I started getting confident in playing football and even if it was soccer, whatever it was, I got confident then when I started getting fit. And was there a decision for you to make there between Mel's and mine or was it just closest? It was the bus went by the front door of my house and I'd say no, that was the easiest decision for my mother. She wasn't going to drop me into the niche to get a bus to Longford, so that was that was where all our family went, cousins and the whole lot, so that's where no, there was no decision really at all. And then when did the goalkeeping really start becoming a, a thing with you, playing games? Yeah, so it probably didn't really start till, um, it was probably around 05, on the 14, it was basically kicking the ball out of the hands, you know, long kick, while able to carry it out by the 45 or that, like, so it kind of fell in there that year, and then we went on to maybe on the 14, and we had a really good team, and just kicked on from probably on the 14 level the whole way, started joining development squads and that, so probably when I was 13, 14, I started playing in the goals. And was it something that you embraced at that stage? Was it something you showed an interest in, or, you know, it just got you on the field? At that time, it probably just got me on the field, and I was happy to be mixing with other lads from other clubs, with the development squads and that, and being part of a different team and that, but... Yeah, at that stage, when I was only 13, 14, 15, it was basically just to get me on the field, get me finding my feet, and then I could really start searching my way. And when did you really start embracing the position? When did you think, yeah, look, I can, you know, I can make something of myself here? I suppose, I got, we, in, in 06, we had a very good on the 14 team, and in 07, there was four that on the 14 team started on our minor team in the county final and it was probably then when Gary Brady and Jimmy Hannafy were over the team that I started thinking Jesus these boys actually have faith in me here and was part of a team then that won the first ever minor championship in the club and I was only on 15 like so it was probably around then that I started thinking just this this could be the way forward. And just take me into college briefly and your football and experiences there. Yeah, college conversation will be brief all right now, but uh, <laughs> um, I went to DIT in 2010 and I played on one of probably the best football teams I've ever I've ever had the privilege to talk out with. Um, Captain by Aidan O'Shea, Colin Walsh, all-star, playing a cornerback, Bernard Allen from Offaly, corner forward. Like We, we had stars all over the field, um, won a fresh as All-Ireland. No team got within ten points, maybe nine, ten points off us the whole way through. Like so, that was a real, real experience. Um, unfortunately, the college career didn't last that long, and I found myself down at loan. Um, I played a bit of Sigerson, but again, it was more the experience that I gained from playing with at loan was because at the time, no more than with yourself at Longford, I was learning from Gary Connaughton, who was the West Mead keeper and who was also back doing a. A college, a college course, like so. He was doing, he was the one in the sticks, but again, he was very good, very helpful to me, and helped me along the way as well. And that was that's the college career wrapped up. Excellent, um, Craig. I'm going to bring you in now, and very similar train of questions. Just start me off with where you grew up. Your monster voice is that where you always grew up? Whereabouts is that located in the county? And uh, your type of uh, primary school going years. Um, yeah, Monster Boys. Monster Boys is just about, oh, it's maybe a five minute drive north of Drogheda. Um, my address is actually Drogheda, so it's it's fairly close. And um, I would have went to school, there's two schools in Monster Boys, both, both kind of big GA schools. Like, you know, my primary school at the time, Harristown, would have been very much the, the principal at the time. The principal currently at the minute would have been winning Loud Senior Championship titles back then, back in the in the 90s. Um, so it was really, it was really um, big, big GA background and everything I've done from when I've started growing up in Monster Boys to, to now. Like it, nothing has really changed. It's even now you can see that the young lads out playing for the school team. It's nothing has changed from when I was there. It's the exact same. It's GA. There's no soccer. If you were caught playing soccer in the schoolyard uh, in the nineties in my school, you'd be in trouble. You'd be you wouldn't be let out for the next lunch break. You know. Ball busted. Yeah. And tell me about your family, Craig. Who's in it? I have three younger brothers, um, two minor championship winners. Unfortunately, I wasn't lucky enough to get that, and they let me know about it. Um, I have three younger brothers, and then a father that would have played, or would have played for a long time. He played up. He won a junior championship last year at 50 years of age. 
you know, in goals. So he would have played for a very, very long time, so he would. And my mother, my father didn't like Gaelic at all. He was more of a soccer man coming from Drada. And it's when he moved out to here to the, my mother's family, who are staunch GAA, they would, they'd be similar enough. They'd have no time for soccer whatsoever. So if I was out taking shots out in the front green, they'd be shouting at me to kick it over the bar. You know, that's just more or less what I was brought up in. And Craig, then, obviously there's a lot of talent in that household and, and the brothers goalkeepers as well and your dad played in the 6-2. Um, was your path marked out from very early doors? No, no, not at all. No, not at all. I would have been... I would have been an outfielder up until the age of 20, 19, 20. Um, I would have been very light. I would have been very tall, but very light. So in regards playing adult football, I would have struggled to get on teams. So I got to a stage that I think, I can't remember, I was trying to think today whether my father was starting to finish playing senior football at the time, or it was a case, I can't remember whether the cones came in around that time when I was kicking cones, or kicking balls off cones and training and sending them. 60, 70 yards down the field that no one else could believe this was happening. I think that's kind of where I started going into goals because I couldn't get on at night, 18, 19, and I kind of settled for, well, yeah, I'll play in goals just to be involved, you know. And just take a little rewind there again back to the primary school. All outfield football, were you one of the staples out around the middle of the park with your height? Or again, was it an issue like Paddy that just took a bit of time to grow into your, your frame? On my own age, I would have been playing all the time, yeah. I would have been one of them kids that um, you'd see on the Rory stories uh, where he gets all the brand new boots, see the socks pulled up to his knees, collar collar pulled up and thinking I was the bee's knees, but I was only a little coward running around the field, but I would have been midfield. Whereas it, there's a chap that would have went to school with me. He was um, probably half the height of me, but carried me a lot of the time because he's, he's an exceptional footballer and still is, you know, but I would have been midfield. I would have been midfield in my own age the whole way up and then maybe the years above I would have been a forward and never, never ever would have played in goals. And taking frees, was that something that you were tipping with in, in your I teenage years? Kind of been in and out. We would have always had decent forwards in school, in the school teams and the club teams that would have been kicking frees, but long range, maybe 45s, I would have been in taking them myself, yeah. Okay, and then into secondary school, where did you end up going there? Was it a big school and what was football like there? Yeah, I actually think it's um, I think it's one of the biggest in Leinster, or maybe Ireland at the minute, um, St Oliver's and Drogheda. Um, at the minute, there's not a big not a big GAA background now. The school would have produced the likes of Gary Kelly, Ian Hart, um, Nicky Colligan. There would have been a lot of really good soccer players that would have come through the secondary school, but I think my... Sixth year, we got to the All Ireland final and got beaten by Virginia and Cavan, and um, two four four eight. What grade was that? I can't remember. I can't remember what it was. I know I know there's a Eugene Keaton that plays with Cavan and James McEnroe. They would have been a very very good team, but that would have been the last kind of team the school would have produced. You know, Owen Lennon that played midfield at Monaghan, and he would have been coaching us as well at the time. And Vinnie Corey would have come in on. On, um, he must have been doing something to do with college, but he would have been in around the time as well. So we had actually a lot of good Gaelic men in the college at the time getting involved with us. And then proper college, third level, uh, where did you end up there? And was there Sigerson Trench if it was a Dundalk? No, I actually didn't. I had coming out of school, I had absolutely zero intention of, of going to college. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was kind of getting a bit pressed at home about going to college. I genuinely had, had no interest at all. I just wanted to play football. I thought at the time, foolish enough, thinking you could make some form of career playing Gaelic football or something. And uh, um, I ended up going to the Institute of Foreign Education in Drada for about six months just to please my mother. And once again, you fall into Gaelic. We played as part of the first Gaelic team that was in the college myself. And I think Biggie Riley was there and a couple of a couple of local lads would have been playing at the time, but it was about six months and I only done it just to get the mother off my back. But to be fair, coming out of it, I got I done the Foundation Award course. Maureen would have come in and done it with me and from then I just would have stuck with the GEA the whole way through. And uh, obviously back in Dundalk IT now, do yeah. you uh, look at the, the younger ones around you and wish that you had that experience now? Or maybe you are having that experience? Oh, I would have loved to, like going back on it now, I would have loved to 
I would definitely wouldn't love to do the studying and all that sort of stuff, but definitely the, the life they live, like I know like Niall Cairns and Reen O'Neill, Sam Murray as well, like all these these boys get really well looked after from their counties and it's more of a relaxed lifestyle to an extent. They're able to go they're able to go and do their gym stuff and they don't have to worry about going out working and it is it is a nice lifestyle they're living. You know, and to, even myself being a DKT, to be able to meet the likes of these boys and see almost live through what they're they're doing now at the minute, you know, it's, it's it is really enjoyable. And um obviously the Dock IT were Sigerson last year, correct? Two years ago. Two, yeah, so we would have played back then, yeah. Yeah, we would have played DCU in Darver, and I think we got bet by a point. Um, Some experience, isn't it? Yeah, it was it was fantastic. So it was we were in the trench cup final there last year against um, Larry County. Uh, Michael Murphy was over them. It was an unbelievable game of football. Uh, thanks, Craig, for that. We jump over to Enda now again. So Enda, similar story. Me and you quite close to each other at home, um, just on the other side of the border, but. Um, a lot of the areas that you would have grown up in, I'd know quite well as well. So give us a, a little feel for Carrie Gallen and family life when there was a young ender running around the place. Well, I suppose like the boys, um, I, I feel very old in this at the moment, Damien, because the boys are talking about the 90s and stuff like that. I, I started school back in uh, 84, back in Carrie Gallen. Um, so uh, it's a long time ago now in, 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 a, in one room of a building that we had back then. But um, yeah, actually, Carrie, it was a very small school. Um, we all grew up together. Um, we all played football together. No more than the boys, like we just played football and football and football. We had nothing else. We only had uh, GA or soccer in the yard or whatever the case may be. We didn't have uh, soccer per se or a team around us or any of that sort of stuff. So all we had was GA. All it was was uh, 60 seconds off the wall, all those kind of games that probably saying it now, a lot of the fellas might know what it was, <laughs> a World Cup or some of those things. So that was kind of where, where we kind of done all our football was on the yard and where we learned all, all, all our skills basically was on the yard and playing against each other and playing, as they say now, small side of games, really, you know. And you didn't have much space in, that was the old school, wasn't it? Um, but the new school yes, yeah. across the road and a little yeah. bit more space, but... Yeah, no, we, we'd have a very little space. There was a field out already. We couldn't get out to it because um, it was like a swamp. So if we did ever get out to it, we came in and uh, she'd be head to toe in muck. And uh, obviously that didn't go well for the teachers and it was worse when you were at home and your uniform was destroyed, like, you know. So um, back then it was just, we just played. We just played every day in the yard. And um, uh, we'd, like I said, we had nothing really else to do. We'd, we'd, we'd played soccer, GEA, but it was kind of uh, basic enough back then in them times, Damien, as you know yourself, all you had was the GEA and the local club. And... Um, how many was in your class end? Was it two or three classes combined? How big was the school? How many boys? No, no, we, we, we had two classes together. So it would have been when we started senior, senior infants and junior infants would have been in the one year room. So you would have been looking at probably around 22. So it would have been quite, quite big. There would have been a bus coming into the, into the school and things like that as well. So the school itself would have been grand. When I started off, there was a, there was three teachers in the school and it, it really expanded when I was leaving. I think we had gone up to five. So again, there was a, an influx of people into the area that drove the, the numbers and obviously the new school building helped that as well, you know. And then school by football as well. I know when I started playing, 10 was the first stage I was and it was school by football. Yeah, no, it, it, exactly the same thing. Yeah, no, it was, it, we, we didn't play until nearly uh, fifth class because you weren't able to get on the teams because, like I said, you had big, strong fellas playing. And, and at that time, we were playing in, in the higher grade in school. And we were actually quite competitive and we were done quite well. Now, I didn't get on the teams um, really until nearly sixth class, uh, fifth and sixth class. And it would have been out the field back then because a neighbor of yours, Terence Reynolds, as you know, would have been the goalkeeper back then. And then I was playing out the field corner forward at that stage. And... Um... Just take me into your family there, and uh, what's the makeup of that? Yeah, well, I have two young. I'm, I'm the oldest in the house, obviously, mum and dad, and then I have um, my sister is next, and then my two younger brothers. Again, house steeped in GEA, but on both sides, um, my mum's family would have been very, would be very heavily involved. She's originally from Carrick and Shannon, St Mary's, and dad obviously was involved all his life from Carrick Allen, like so. Again, it comes back to it. Back in those times, you went out and you played in the garden, you played football. You went out to the pitch during your summers, you played football, you, you cycled everywhere at that stage and all, all you had was the GEA. And like, to be honest, I think that was where a lot of the skills came from. And 
um, no more than the rest of the boys. I didn't really start my career in goals, and it was by a, a pure fluke that that actually happened one day when we were out playing. On, there was another 14 game, and I happened to be at the match. I didn't even have gear with me, and the coach asked me to go on goals, and I never got out of goals after. Like so, <laughs> one of those things. We didn't have uh, too many goalkeepers around at that stage in the area. And was it something that you possessed at that stage, Enda, or was it just a case that you were a body, that you weren't causing them too much grief and he left you there? Or were you showing a, an application for it? I, I well, At the time, I used to play a corner forward and uh, people used to say I was handy enough, but I don't even remember that. But um, I, I went into goals and I played quite well and I, I really enjoyed it. Um, probably, I think, as everybody says, goalkeepers are slightly mad. I like the fact that you could make saves and you could be the hero. You never really thought about being the villain back then. Didn't matter if the goal went in, but if you made a few saves, sure you were a great fella. You know, so that was the reason why. And like I said, uh, I got encouragement to stay there, uh, possibly because it was it was quite small and and no more than was Paddy was saying earlier. I had a tendency to eat a little bit too much, you know, as well. So <laughs> it was easier to put me in goals, and it was solid. I could catch the ball and I could kick it. And as you know, back then. We were kicking the ball off the ground um, in the early 90s, so I could kick it off the ground and could get it out, and that was another reason why they stuck me in goals, you know. And then thinking about going to secondary school, obviously you had Carrie Allen on your doorstep, which was very appealing, and then you had mine yeah. up the road. Was that an attraction at any stage, or was it always Carrie Allen? Well, I actually done the entrance exam in, in mine. The, the, again, the, door, the bus went through Carrie Allen at that time, but I was always going to go to Carrie Allen, like everybody... I think we only what in the class that we had. I think only maybe three or four went up to mine, actually up towards that Gartamon area, and the rest is all went to Carrigal. And so it wasn't really I could walk to school every day, so it wasn't anywhere else only Carrigal and where I was going, you know. And then when you left secondary school, where did that end up taking you? Well, when I left secondary school, I went to college and then for a short while in Saigo uh, and then an illness meant that I wasn't able to continue in school. I, I played played for freshers there with Sligo. We had a great team. We got to an All-Ireland final. Um, uh, Dermot Higgins of Mayo, was aged, the current Donegal coach, uh, was actually uh, playing as well, you know, So uh, and Mayo manager. So we had, we had a good team. We got to a freshers final. And then uh, due to something else that's out of my control, I never went back. And then I just went straight working after um, I, I got back to myself. Um, I went back to I was work in Dublin and that, that was basically it from 99 on. Great. Um, Paddy, I'll come back to you now. I want to talk a little bit about football and <clears throat> playing with the Gales. So St. Vincent's as a teenager and uh, then success, as you say, came to you very quick with a minor championship as a 15-year-old. So maybe pick it up from there and uh, developing up into adult football. Yeah, so um, 06, we won. We had a team that won everything in the 14. So a lot of that team carried on to, to play a minor football then with St. Vincent's. I said we got an awful lot of luck in the county final that day and we won it 1-5 to 2-5. And it was the first time we won the championship in the club's history. Um Following on then, I think it was the following year, yeah, 2008, we won um, an under-16 championship with the team that won all under-14. And then we waited until 2010, the that team came again and we won the minor championship for the second time. And there are only two, there are only two championships that we have in the club at minor level. Um, 2013, we won an under-21 with Father Manning Gales. It was my fourth final in a row. And it's the only under-21 that I have, so you can guess for yourself that the other three were lost. Um, started playing with Father Manning Gales senior team in 2009. Uh, Tommy McCormick was the manager, and I was only out of under-16. Under so he he had faith in me, and he started me in the first round of the, the league against Conley's. Um, but the year before, even though I was too young, I used to train with the seniors the whole time and he was very good to me in the sense that if we had a challenge game or that, he'd always make sure he gave me 10 or 15 minutes on the side of it as well. So, um, yeah, it was probably that. And then playing playing senior football in since 2009, right up until now, um, we had a little bit of a dip and we got relegated to intermediate two years ago, but we won it last year. So um, we're back up in senior and that's really it. And then, obviously, Paddy, the early part of this last decade, 2010, um, a huge year with winning the, the Leinster Minor, and then a couple under 20 um, provincial 
under 21 finals in the years after that yeah like uh, 2010 was probably the best year I've ever witnessed in football in the sense that I went to college and won the All-Ireland was with Longford and won the Leinster and was with the club minors and won the championship so it was probably that was probably the best year I can recall that I've ever had playing football um, 2011 we went on and got to another Leinster final under 21 to lose out to, to Wexford and 2013 I lost out in another Leinster final uh, to Kildare both of them played in Omo or more Park down in Leash Yeah and nothing really in the two games uh, I think a point was it a point to Wexford maybe two and then three to Kildare Yeah a point Wexford bets by a point and yeah, Kildare bets by, by the goal the only goal of the game uh, so then the breakthrough to the senior to the Longford senior pa- panel. When did that come? When you were tired. <laughs> well, <laughs> and I got called into the to the Longford senior panel in 2011. So it was after the year we got to the Leinster final. Um, I think that year we got out of Division Three, Damien, if I recall, and Len Ryan was the manager. And the last game in the league. We had been promoted with Wexford, but we had to play Wexford at home, if I'm right. And that was my that was my debut. So I played that game in the league because we were already home and host. And didn't play then probably, I think, was it 2014? Jack Sheedy came in and we kind of split the league. And then you played the championship and I made my senior debut in the Denser Championship against Offaly in 2015. Um in a seven point swing or something like that we were down by four at half time against Offaly and we turned around and won by three so yeah that's when I probably made the the breakthrough and um, just those early days Paddy coming in because obviously I can relate to a very similar situation when I came on board and Gavin Turner was there and just what was in your head as being uh, what about a 20 year old at that stage yeah so like I came in there at 20, I think, I think it was 20 or that. And I, well, at 19, I think it was, because we, in 2011, we had that, we were in under 21. And I think at that time, the seniors in under 21 kind of trained on the same pitch. And it was, we had the top end, the seniors at the bottom end, but the senior players on the under 21 team either juggled between them. So I, I suppose I didn't really think too much of it till I was finished under 21, because out of all the years I had with the 20s, we had two long runs, which took us right up. So I was playing under 21 football right up until, you know, senior was nearly over as well at the time. Um, yeah, that was really, that was really it. Like I, I didn't really think too much about it till, till under 21 was finished. And I going into pre-season, I was like, there's no ducking and diving here. Now it's, it's senior football and senior inter-county and you're training hard from start to finish. And Paddy, looking back over all of your career up until this point in time, um, what people have you felt have influenced you in a in a positive way, and with the whole goalkeeping position as well? Yeah, so the whole goalkeeping, I I've been very lucky, Damien. Um, I said like, I probably goalkeeping position in all three. My brother played in the Leinster under twenty one final with Longford, and I was just saying it to him the other day, and we were kind of slagging. And as you know yourself, being siblings and that, like you wanted, to, I wanted to get to the place that I could better him and he was trying to better me at football so he had a massive influence on me like I was going watching him playing in goals for the county under 21s watching him playing in goals for Drumlish like and I wanted that and that's that's why I just he he was the main the main reason but like as I said I've been very lucky I went into an inter-county scene where you were there and very good you know took me under and like trained me hard and I learned so much from you and um, was down at Lone had Gary Connaughton, like great, a great, a great goalie as well, an all star. And um, then like there now at the minute, like Gavin Turner's the goalkeeping coach with Longford, like and he's he's the best you get, like and learning so much from him and listening to him talking as well. Do you know, like there was even a year there in Drumnish, like Eamon Crow came out and done a couple of training sessions with me in Drumnish at under twenty one, and like there was me looking, I had seen him playing in county finals and. You know, like I've I've been lucky enough to to always have someone someone good to look up to and fall back on as well, to keep me on the right track. Excellent, thanks, Paddy. Uh, Craig, I'll come back to you. And anyone that sees Craig's or in this picture, they're both frozen, but they can both hear us and we can hear them. Um, so Craig, Nave Martin is your club. Um, just a little bit about how you've been getting on in adult football, and then when you got on to the loud panel. 
Um, as I said earlier on, I would have started around 16, 17, 18. I would have been trying to get onto the senior adult team then as an outfielder. And um, we would have won a senior league back 2000 and eight, I think it was seven or eight, my father's and all my uncles are playing. I was only sixteen playing there. And then we would I would have went in goals around two thousand and nine for half a season. We were we were senior thirty years um last year and never got relegated, never got promoted. So we were just kinda of always there, not really contributing the whole pile to the competition in the division or the championship. Um and then we went and got yeah, I went and goals around two thousand and nine for half a season. I was around I was when I was playing under twenty one football and I got called up to the under twenty one team, similar enough to what Paddy's situation was. We would have trained the under twenty ones and the seniors on the same field or in the same area. And I think I think Stuart Reynolds, who would have been the goalkeeper for Loud for a long time, he stepped away. So I think he'd done a bit of a pre-season and then stepped away. And then I think Peter Fitzpatrick would have come along and asked me to get involved then. So from very early, I would have been with the Loud senior team and Loud under 21 team. So straight away, I was the number one goalkeeper for the club team too. But the problem was I was going from being a goalkeeper with the club team to being an outfielder with the club team. I never really, I might have played three games in nets and then three games outfield and then back into nets and... There was never real much consistency to what I was doing with the club up until maybe when I come home from Australia. I come home from Australia in around 2014, 2015. And ever since then, I would have been more or less kind of in goals full time with the club team. We would have got the two senior finals in the last two years, lost both of them. And we would have got to two of the league finals, three league finals and won two of them. So in the last number of years, we would have done, started to get our act together in, in, in senior club football with the club. And the breakthrough then to the Loud Seniors, how did that come about? Uh, my first year with the senior team was December 2010, the year the, of the Lance the Final, the notorious Lance the Final. Um, I, looking back on it now, I wasn't ready. You know, as I said, I probably would have been only a goalie six, seven months, never would have trained. All I, all I knew how to do was to kick the ball out. And I was there too early at the time. I thought, Jesus, I could get a chance here, you know. Um, looking back at now, it would have been the worst thing possible that could have happened to me at the time. You know, I wasn't ready for it. Um, I would have stayed there up until I went to Australia in 2012 um, and then left. And then I missed two seasons with Loud in... With Aidan O'Rourke, I wasn't there at all for him. And then when I came back, Colin Kelly was in charge. He took me back up into the team. And we were struggling a wee bit at the start. Um, we got knocked out of the Leinster Championship. And it, I think it was the qualifiers we played. Leitrim, actually, I think it was. I think it was Leitrim we played in Drogheda. And that would have been my first game. I never would have got any O'Born Cup games in the, the three years I was there previous. Never played a couple of challenge games, but was never given any time at all to to try and get in and get that jersey off Neil Gallagher, who was, was exceptional, was there for a long time too. Looking back at it now, I hadn't a chance of taking it off, but in my head at the time I did. Um, so Colin Kelly took me in against Leitrim. I'd done well against Leitrim off the back of a couple of performances for the, the Low Junior team, who would have won the, I think we got as far as the all Ireland semi-final, Sligo beat us. And then, yeah, I would have got into the senior team and played well against Leitrim. Then we went down to play Tipperary in Taurus and we got an awful hiding that day. That was only my second senior game for Loud. I ended up dropping, we were probably 20 points down, but I ended up dropping the ball into the net. Um, Colin O'Reard, and I'll never forget, I know he's over there sunning himself in, in Sydney, but um, that's one thing I'll never, it's, it'll never leave me till the day I finish playing football or the day I died. It was that feeling of dropping the ball in the net in my second game. I just thought it was over before it even started. But in fairness to Colin Kelly, he stuck with me and I would have stayed there for a long time. And I, I haven't I haven't left since 2000 and 2015. Yeah, 2015, I would have been part of the panel up until now. Great. Thanks, Craig. And just before I move over to Enda, just two things that I, I kind of want to flag with people there in case they skip by. But just the, the paths that these lads have had to deal with to get into a position, whether it be in their club or at inter-county level. 
that it's not an easy path. There has always been obstacles in front of them with keepers that have been have been strong and the amount of work that they have to do to get into it. And also there, just what Craig is after saying, and the other two lads will vouch for it as well, about how one incident in a game that they were been hammered in, but it's still in Craig's head and it's still playing on his mind. So, you know, just be wary of your own keepers that, you know, you think that they get over these things, but there's somebody who's playing at the very height of the game and there's something like that that's still playing on their mind as well. And Paddy and Enda both testify to that. I know I can testify to it as well. Um, so, Enda, just again, if we can jump forward to your breakthrough on to the Leitrim panel and how did that come about? Were you a minor prior to it in under-21? Yeah, no, I, I was lucky enough. I, I was played at every level with the, with the county with a under-16, a minor, uh, under-21. But really how I started was... Um, in 97, we played against Mayo in Castlebar, and I played quite well in that match uh, under Pat Pryor. And then the following year, uh, I was very, very lucky. Peter McGinnity asked me to come into the under-21 squad, and I was a minor, the minor keeper as well as that as well. And that year, we got to uh, um, a con- both Connacht finals, under-21, where we lost to that great Galway team of Porrick Joyce, Michael Donnellan, uh, Derek Savage, all those players, Fahis. Um, they would beat us in Carrick uh, by uh, two or three points and then that same year we went on and won a Connacht minor uh, in 98 and played that great Tyrone team in the All-Ireland semi-final with Stephen O'Neill and Cormac McAnallen and all those fellas that kind of went on and won All-Irelands and then uh, on 90, obviously 99 uh, a medical issue came up and I, I didn't play much then really at the missed that year but then the following two years I played County under 21 and then I was brought in Joe Reynolds uh, at the time brought me in along with Peter. Peter used to, Peter McGinnity had me training with the seniors as well, with Martin McHugh back then as well, and Martin Pryor. Uh, so I got great experience around that time to play, but I'm really, I made my debut in 2002 um, under Declan Rowley. Uh, I, was very, uh, I was very pleased to get, that year we played against Sligo in the championship and they beat us by a couple of points. Uh, and that, that made my debut after that as well. And then I played for a couple of years and then, kind of between myself and Garrett Phelan, we were kind of in and out uh, all those times. And then I took a bit, a wee bit of a break in the middle and I went down and I played a bit of soccer uh, with Ballon Mallard United. Um, brilliant experience. Uh, really, really enjoyed it. And then played a bit of club soccer down there as well within the Skilling Rangers. And then came back uh, under uh, John Morrison and Mickey Morn and played for a couple of seasons with them. And then uh, kind of left because of the... Uh, the birth of my daughter I was 30 at that stage so uh, priorities of family take over back then and then I was taken back in a couple of times then by Sean Sean Hines brought me back for a little while and then I played uh, the junior championship with Leitrim as well like so I've kind of been playing on and off for Leitrim since I've been 16 years of age to be honest and the more than the boys um, looking back there was times where I felt I should have been playing and when looking back now I, I probably was way off it at that stage as well but you learn by by sitting there and looking and seeing what's going wrong and reflecting on what you're doing as well. I was very, very lucky as well in Carrie Gallon. I made my debut at Carrie Gallon when I was 16 and uh, under Brian Doyle and uh, Michael Riley. And I played, played at the club for, the, for 22 years, having never missed the championship year. With some great times, won intermediate championships. Unfortunately, lost a, a senior championship by a point. And lost um, a Connacht Intermediate Club final by a point as well from Tour McKinney from Mayo. So, um, the more than the boys, there's 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 memories that you kind of block out, uh, and when you do make a mistake, and it's probably one of the most important things that people have to remember uh, in that goalkeeping position is that there's good days, but the majority of the time, as you come away from a match, very very disappointed, and you need a really good structure around home where people can say you can talk to them and you can vent and you can kind of chat about what went on in the matches as well. So it's very very important. It's a lonely position, it's a great position, but it's something that coaches need to be very aware of on that as well, especially with younger kids. Thanks, Enda. Lads, I'm going to throw you one question each here. We'll just go around the table really quickly, and uh, then we'll get into our discussion. But um, Paddy, I'll start with you. Yep. What element of madness do you have? <laughs> what element of madness do I have? Yeah, apart from the beard. 
I suppose for Damien, you have to have some bit of madness to be in goals, anyway. And that's what the boys were saying there earlier. You have to have some bit of madness. I wouldn't be able to put a finger on it because I'd like to think that I'm, I'm fairly quiet, but I know myself there would be a bit of madness in the back. But to put the finger on it, I just wouldn't be able to. And uh, Paddy, is your madness um, like in your head when you're away from the field that you're always thinking about things and, you know, not so much that the, your actions, because you are very cool and calm and collective when you're on the pitch. Yeah, you bring everything away from the field, Damien. And like what Craig was saying there, like, and if you want to go back to what I was talking about playing the Leinster final in 2011, I got I got serious talk about <laughs> dropping a ball that cost us the game in the first 10 minutes. And that's nine years ago, and it's still brought up to this day. And nice and calm talking to people about it, but it absolutely boils me. You know, like, it's dead in the water it's done not much more I can do about it now like I didn't go out to do it that day no more than Craig and it's just things like that like it'd probably be a bit of madness to away from the pitch when I'm on my own or with the family or that giving out about things like that but on the field calm cool hopefully a bit collective Craig where's your madness? Um, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be capable Damien, of saying or doing anything Um like be it training, be it in the dressing room, be it on the pitch. I, it, I, I don't even know what I'm going to say or do sometimes. And uh, it, it would never, it would never, it would, uh, would nerve some people that's around me that know like what, what's this Egypt going to do next or say next. Or I, would, I tend to do um, a fair amount of mess and which might upset certain managers, but it's just the way I go on. And in your head, Craig, are you in control? Yeah, yeah. I would always be fairly calm, but it's more of a um, coping mechanism. Maybe I'm using the wrong term, but if I'm nervous in some way, the only way I get rid of it is by getting involved in something or hiding someone's towel in the dressing room or, or moving someone's boots that might be um, might be all geared up to the perfect warm up and the perfect uh, laces are all the same length. I'd be going over, I'd, I'd change them or I'd, um, I'd usually blame somebody else for doing it. But at this stage, you know, I'm in the dressing room long enough, they know, usually know to come blaming me straight away. And that whole, you know, you're talking about the dressing room there, but even out in the field, the goalkeeper is a very isolated person on the whole pitch. And there are only certain elements of the game that the keeper can control. And you see it with a lot of teenage goalkeepers that the game has been played away and it's getting away from them and they lose the rag with umpires or they lose the rag when a referee gives a decision. Um, and it's because they're, I feel that they're so limited in control of the match that they want to do their best, but they can't influence it. And sometimes that sort of stuff can come out. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I know myself, like uh, you probably deal with two different types of way. I know a lot of the club and anybody from loud that might be listening in or listen to the video back. Um, I played in the senior final two years ago where we were seven points up and I got a black card with 15 minutes to go and we ended up losing the game by a point. Um, like for me, I would, with the club, I would have been going out the field a lot with the ball. You know, still thinking I'm an outfielder and I'm capable of playing outfield and ultimately it got me that time. Um, I know also times when I need to calm myself down and I'm aware I need to calm myself down. There's times I go and I literally stand out with the goals. Now, obviously, in a control situation where you have your team has the ball down your end of the field, but I would stand behind the goals or I'd have a chat with the umpire drinking a, um, a bit of the water or something. I'd literally try and literally stand the other side of the white line and try and talk about the weather to the umpire or some lad that might be giving me abuse behind the wall. I'd have a chat with him and say, do you listen to that? Heed? All he's done is give out to me for the last 20 minutes, you know, something like that to try and take my head out of the fact that there's probably not a whole pile I can do in the game at the minute. Yeah, and again, coaches that are listening in here, these are just interesting things to know about what's going on inside your goalkeeper's head and the coping mechanisms that they might need in a situation like that. And then to ensure that they're able to keep focus for, for that one moment or a couple of moments in a match where they are needed. And uh, your little touch of madness, what is it? Well, it's probably, um, it's kind of, I, no more than Craig and the boys, I would switch very quickly. Like, I would come into the dressing room and what Craig would be doing would drive me insane because I would have to sit in the same place, the gear goes out the same way, everything has to be the right way. But yeah, to go on the pitch and people would call me hugely contrary. I would be I would be desperate. Like, I would be giving out to the referees, to the boys in line. But it just felt that I was focused in the game. It was me being in the game. My head was in the game. 
Um, I was ready to go. Um, I'm, I was kind of just, I was there where I needed to be. I was so focused in the game, but it allowed me to be nearly interactive in the game rather than just standing there. So the more than Craig, I might have a chat with the umpire if I knew him or something like that. But generally, I would kind of on to defenders or giving forwards guff or kind of on to the referee, make a decision. He could be at the other end of the field and I'd be still roaring at him. But it just felt that I was still involved in the game and that was my concentration levels as well. What used to drive me mental was fellas that used to be one-on-one and they kick it over the bar or something like that. Like that, that just kind of drove me insane. Like I just wanted to make saves. I wanted to be in the game and I felt the more vocal that I was and the more contrary it was, I was in the game as well. So that was just me. A lot of fellas tried to stop me, but it didn't really work, unfortunately, for them. I'd say a yeah. lot of managers thinking, what kind of a head the ball is this lad in here? Because they'd be as quiet and they'd be in great form coming into the match, but come onto the pitch or come onto training and I'd be desperate. You were a lad that liked living on the edge. Very much so, yeah. And to be fair, I've never got sent off. I never got a black card. I got a few yellows, all right, but it was for more or less mounted more than anything else. It wasn't anything contrary, but I just had to feel that I was involved in the game and that, that the game wasn't passing me by. And, and by doing that, I was very, very local, vocal to my own players as much as the other boys, as the opposition. Uh, Paddy referenced Gavin Turner there earlier. Gavin has a question there that we're coming to in a couple of points' time. Um, but Paddy, you're going to be talking a little bit about Gavin now. So what does a typical goalkeeping session look like? on the field, Paddy. So you go out on a Tuesday or Thursday night, whatever it is. What does Gavin have in store for you? We go out on a Tuesday. It's all about getting get moving first and getting the hands getting the hands nice and warm. So you just be doing like load of quick feet, load of sharp stuff, get the hands nice and warm, lateral movements, and then basically just getting the body hitting the ground. Like nothing not straight away you're going into big heavy shots, but like, you know, Gavin will be there and he'd be just nice little handy little passes to the to cones that he'd be set up like and it'd be just getting the body down hitting the ground, then we'd open it up like, and it'd be more intense sort of shooting and the whole lot. And we try and bring everything into it. Like, so he'll say to me before a training session, what do you think from the weekend? And I'd say, well, you know, maybe might just work on the near post shot or something. Like I feel like I nearly got caught in a game or something like this at the weekend. And very good. We'll go and we'll work on that. Like, so it, we'd, we'll talk before, but usually we'd always at the start, you'd, you get moving get the feet going, get the hands nice and warm, get the flight of the ball, get the feet warm, just kicking the ball and, you know, just getting the body hitting the ground nice and early in the session. Yeah, it's a well-told story now at this stage about Cluxton and the two All-Ireland finals this year where he uh, didn't make a save at one point and he went back and spent two weeks working on it religiously and then ended up making a save in the replay or in the the one final. Um, And having that relationship with a coach if it's at inter-county level or just the manager of a team whereby maybe the goalkeeper is getting absolutely zero work but they can have that conversation and say look at these are a couple of things I feel I just need to work on in the minute can you incorporate them into training uh, Craig anything different there that you might be doing or anything specific for your own game um, I, suppose, I suppose for a lot of years I would have been the lad that's coming out and before even stretching a hamstring or stretching a quad I'd be leathering balls about trying to hit lads in the head or Lads was going out for a little whittle behind the, the flood lay I'd be the one that's trying to hit him in the head, but I've got to a stage now the body's just probably telling me that you can't be doing that anymore. So I'd spend a bit of time myself just trying to get the body going. And then when when the session's called in, we would have a little team brief ourselves, maybe a few minutes, and then back over to the, the goalie coach. And we'd have, um like if we had a game the weekend, we would discuss bits and pieces or um, I want to know his thoughts on something that I might have done or I, I didn't do in a game. And then it'd be a case then of just working on, trying and cover everything as best you can, footwork, handling, high balls, shot stopping, a bit of kicking in between the, when you get that shout from the coach, uh, we need we need a few of the goalies for whatever they're doing, you know. So the goalie coach, he does it well. He tries to cover everything in, every, in, in, in one training session just to keep us ticking over to an extent. But... As you said, you, you might have to go down and get involved with the, the, the full squad at certain points of the training session. And then, Enda, something we haven't touched on already is that you're back on the, the county scene, but not as a goalkeeper, but as the goalkeeping coach. So from that point of view, what are you looking at to try and work your couple of keepers on on any night that you go out training? 
again, it, it, it depended on the season. Like, obviously, in the early season, you'd be trying to get them to get a bit more uh, anaerobic or aerobic work of getting up and getting down on the ground as well. But again, it's the analyst, the analyzing of the game of what they've done the previous week for me would be very, very important. So, the first night, you might have a conversation, you might ring them on the Monday before training on the Tuesday and ask them, How do you think it went? What do we have to work on? And then I'd build my session around that. So, generally, we would always go with a warm up. Then we go technical work, so head, hands, feet. Then we do a bit of conditioning work when the boys be away. And then we would do a good bit then on positional work and then some kicking. So again, you're, you're kind of, no more than the lads, you're kind of trying to cover everything, but you're trying to tailor the session to what the goalkeeper felt or how it went. And again, if, for the sub goalkeeper, the other fellow that you had there with you, you'd ask for his input as well. And maybe the Tuesday evening before the session, what, what did you think, how it went and stuff like that as well. So it has to be very much a collaborative effort between you, the coach, and the keepers themselves. And like on some honest feedback is very important as well. Like sometimes you might not want to say, but you could say, listen, you should have done better with that ball that came across, or you should have maybe got your hands, you should you didn't use your feet, you were very static and things like that as well. So you need to be doing a bit of analysis on the on the coaches as well. But even going into as a coach, going into a club taking young goalkeepers, you need to assess where they're at. So again, I would keep that very, very basic on the hands, hands and feet see what their body position like is when and when they die and then obviously what they're kicking as well. Yeah. So you'd be kind of looking at a holistic um, coaching session for everybody you're trying to do, but feedback and, and communication is absolutely key as a coach coming in and working with your two goalkeepers. And then, uh, like, you have two keepers there with Leitrim and sometimes you might have three, and obviously both of them have different strengths and weaknesses and one of them is probably a mainstay and the other is not. So just the challenges that tailor in a session for two lads with different strengths and weaknesses and then also keeping the guy that's maybe the sub keeper keeping him interested and motivated yeah again generally what usually happens is usually it's the under 21 goalkeeper if there's no sub goalkeeper there as well so what we do is we kind of work both of them they'll be very similar in what they have to work on um, but again I would tailor the session that if if the sub keeper needed a lot of work would say uh, on a low shot or a dive I would incorporate that into the session because it would be a great confidence builder for the first keeper if he's making save after save after save as well but you're kind of working on all areas you need to incorporate strengths and weaknesses for both within the session so you're kind of nearly making a, a full picture for everybody within your session itself and um, for kind of keep them motivated it's, a, it's kind of you have to kind of keep the, the positive talk very 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 good what they're doing well you kind of have to say to them listen you have to wait your opportunity when it's going to come you need to be ready and you need to be working both mentally and physically ready to go whenever you're going so it's building that trust and confidence within your goalkeeping team that you're working with is very very important and I suppose and as well if the truth be told both Paddy and myself would have been in a similar position when we got onto a panel at a young age and had an established keeper in front of us we were more than happy to sit there for a couple of years particularly when we were still playing under 21 but obviously it's an under 20 grade that's there now and there's not as much of that but you're kind of happy to be there for a couple of years but as soon as that first team football ends the itch is sort of on you and you're either you want to get in or else leave it to somebody else yeah, it's, it's a difficult balance and act on that now, to be honest, because more than yourself, I was behind Garrett for a number of years. And, and when I was brought in, Martin McHugh was there as well. So you just have to bide your time. Patience is very, very important. Um, but it, again, you have to believe in the, and you have to kind of build confidence in the keeper that's there. Like, again, you have to make that very, very clear. If there's an established number one, he is number two, but he has to work as hard as number one to, to dislodge him. And if there is a mistake or an error or there's a drop in form, that's his opportunity that he needs to take over as well. It's a difficult position. We were all in it. But I think patience is the key thing as well. And once you're willing to work, and if you're getting game time with your club and things are going quite well, it's a, it's a little more easier to get that motivation factor there, you know. Uh, finally, for now, Enda, is there something that's going on in the inter-county scene that's not really happening on the club scene that club managers listening in here could implement with their own club team, whether it's an underage or an adult club team? I, I think there has to be specialisation into the position. It's such a critical position now, both in club and inter-county football. You have to nearly mirror both. So if you have a coach or, you've, or, you, or you have a player and you're looking for him a goalkeeper, especially the younger age, you need to train that position. You need to make him feel special that he's going to be actually wanting to play in that position because 
it's hard enough to get a goalkeeper to play, but if you've got a good one, you need to work really, really hard. And so you do need to take him away from the session. Like he, he still needs to play a bit of ball and get used to his handling skills and his first touch and his solo and his hop and stuff like that to be comfortable on the ball. But it's absolutely vital. He has to be taken away, we'll say, maybe on the run and drills or on kick pass drills and things like that as well, where he can work on individual things as well. And I think that's the critical factor. You have to make it a specialised position and you have to train your keepers in your sessions for that. So even if it's a selector, just taking them away and getting somebody in to maybe show them a few techniques that they need to be done from outside of working on their hands, working on their feet, working on the dive, things to work on. But it needs to be very specialised. You need to make them feel that they're the goalkeeper, they're the number one. And if they do that, you'll build on the confidence that the, that the keepers had that they want to play in goals. Thanks, Enda. Uh, Paddy, just coming back to you again, and we're going to talk a little bit about mistakes and how you deal with them. So... You talked about that mistake back in 2011, I think you referenced. Um, how does the rest of the game look for you when there's a mistake made and the day is then after that? Yeah, so like back then, I was only 19, 20. Like the rest of the game was nearly, no point in lying about it, like the rest of the game was nearly gone for me. Like, do you know, nearly a mistake backed up by a mistake. But, do you know, the, the week after it, like you're downing yourself and you're feeling sorry for yourself and his, it, it, it's only a game at the end but in the last couple of years like I have don't get me wrong I've made mistakes in a lot of games you know not big ones again but like they're just normal mistakes that a corner forward is making I'm making the very same on a ball coming in maybe just kick pass and goes a little bit off kick out goes to the wrong man and um, the, the only way that I deal with them Damien is like you just you blank it completely out like that someone told me before I don't know who it is like if it's 60 minutes or 70 minutes if the ball hits the back of the net and 30 seconds into the game the referee doesn't turn around and blow the final whistle you, you still have you still have 59 you still have 69 minutes to go like so it's it's just about getting your head in the I'm going to the stage now that if the ball goes into the back of the net if it's my fault the cornerback fault midfielders forwards whoever's fault it is I have the kick out taken and nine times out of ten you have hit your man with the ball because you're so focused on the next play, next play, next play. And I know lots of people say like it's it's very hard to like be like that, but like it's just something that you have to keep training yourself into. If you're confident in what you've worked on a training, if you're confident in how you've grown into your position as a goalkeeper, then mistakes are part and parcel of the game. No one goes out to make them. Um, you're there just as well as the management's there. Anyone is there to to be part of a winning team, a losing team or whatever it is and you just want to give your your all for it like so and um, that's just just keep going like keep just backing yourself like and the next night you get to train and you work yourself to the bone on whatever happened if it was a couple of bad kickouts if it was not coming off your line quick enough you're working on you know it was it right to stay on the line was it right to go and come off the line you know was the forward too close to the goals was I too far away from him you know, you just have to sit down, like, and that's what you do. Like, I, I think it happened, like, down in down in Carlo this year in the O'Baron Cup. It was my first game of the year. I came on with 10 minutes to go, and I'd say the boys can vouch for it, and you too, Damien, can say it like that. It is the worst place ever to go on in the middle of a game. Coming on at half time is okay, but when you're coming on, 10 minutes to go in a game, and Carlo were coming at us, we were already true, and that's nothing about it, but they were bombarding us with ball. I hadn't touched one. And there was one ball that came in and me and Gavin had a good talk about it the following Tuesday training and I'd done the right thing. But a player that wasn't a goalkeeper might say, well, you could have caught it. And that was the argument that we had. But me and Gavin and the other two goalkeepers, Pat and Dahi, all came to the conclusion that it was the right thing to do was to punch it. I was fresh on. And you just, they're the thing, you just have to learn from everyone that's around you as well and just get on. Yeah, so Paddy, like... Um... Who do you have these conversations with? So you reference Gavin and Paddy and Dahi there. Or, um, have you ever been with a sports psychologist or is there somebody close to you in your family that you can have these conversations? Or are you trying to figure it all out in your own head? I'd have the conversations with the brother David, like, um, you know, especially when, it, when it's a club game and like he's there and you know, he's on the field and he sees it as well. Like, and he, he's the one that I'd be... I'd be going to most of the time. Um, I'd also I'd have the conversation with the girlfriend as well. Like she's big into football, and you know she knows it. Like her family is big into sport as well. Like so, she knows what what's been going through my head. And 
you know, it's nice to have people to talk to and to plan it out with. Like your mom and dad are listening as well, and they give their two their two cents as well, and the sister and dad. Like so, like I have loads of people around me that will talk and they'll tell me if you're right, you're wrong, or they don't know themselves. Like so. And Craig, just with your Leinster coach's hat on there, and really specifically to Gavin's question there about advice to young players in the goalkeeping position to dealing with mistakes, but also to the coach that's over that young goalkeeper when the mistake is made. What advice would you offer there? I think I touch back and end this point of, of you have to offer it. You have to show confidence in your goalkeeper. Um, you really, like, if you, if you don't have confidence in your goalkeeper, first of all, the goalkeeper knows. The goalkeeper feels it, be, whether you speak to him or how you speak to him, they know. And uh, my best football would have been with um, Colin Kelly, who I knew no matter what I'd done, he had my back and he was going to play me. You know, so I I didn't have to worry about uh, certain scenarios. I just had to worry about going out there and doing what I what I done and what I was used to doing. You know, and that's he probably got the best football out of me in terms of a goalkeeper. Um, but what I'd say in advice for young goalkeepers is like you just have to look at we'll say Stephen Cluxton. I don't know what all Ireland final was against Mayo. Um, mistakes happen. Do you know what I mean? Does I, I I've never seen a goalkeeper. Um, to go through a full career without making a mistake. So you kind of have to accept the times that these things do happen. Um, in regards to recovering from them, it's it's realising you made the mistake and and something that um, I would have picked up from Pete McGrath at his time at Loud would be um, what's important now. That was, he constantly kept saying it to us uh, outfielders too. You have, to, you have to think in game about what's important now. Um, at different stages of the game. So if I kick a ball over a sideline, I have to I have to think what is important now. And at the time, it could be just something as simple as the next kicker goes down the middle. Or if, if a ball comes in and I, and I go to punch it and I get bumped in the air and I miss it, I have to understand what's important now. Next time the ball comes in, do I need to jump earlier? If um, if people are, are getting under my skin, as I said earlier on, I like to go around and step behind to the side of the goals and have a conversation to just... To re refix my mind back into what I'm doing, do you know, um, that's kind of it. Like yeah, as you said, mistakes happen. You just have to learn over time. Like as, as I said, like they happen. but like, they still upset me now. That could have happened eight years ago. But uh, what I have learned myself over the last number of years is how to deal with them. And I probably grew a thick skin in the sense that um, I'm big enough to take it on the chin. I'm big enough to know when I've done something wrong. And kind of touching on what Paddy was saying. If if I do make a mistake in a game, I will think about it and I'll go off and people will tell me, be it when I come home, be it parents wanting to talk to me, girlfriend, brothers, whatever, they will want to talk to me. At the time, I will not answer them. I'll nearly go into my room and shut myself away, let myself think about it the next day. And over time, I'll start talking. And by the time Tuesday night comes around, I will have that conversation with the manager or the goalkeeping coach or some of my teammates to try and figure out something that, these mistakes don't happen again. Yeah, thanks, Craig. And just coming back to Gavin's question there from my own perspective, um, a teenage player, 14, 15, 16, 18, even 20, some of them are not great at taking on board the wisdom that we have as adults. So the advice that I would offer is to create a really safe environment for those lads that when mistakes are made, that there's not a recrimination thing, that they don't feel bad about it, that the players on their team don't make them feel bad about it and that the player can be given loads of opportunities in training to make mistakes in a safe, comfortable environment and you will feel that your goalkeeper will build confidence and the mistakes will become less and less. And then um, age is knowledge and as you get older, they will get better at dealing with those. But I think for a younger player, that safe environment is the most important thing. Um, Endo, we're going to come back to you here. So the question, we spoke about this during the week. I'm going to share my screen in a second and pop up a graphic. We're going to talk about the, I set the lads a challenge um, as regards to the amount of time that they feel is important to spend on certain skills and the amount of time that they actually spend on it. So if we look at this first one here, core skills, so the lads feel that these skills are important and that they should spend 57% of their time working on these skills. But when we break down their training schedule, it works out at 43% that they're working on. 
Um, if we come down to their football skills and open play, their perceived importance is 15% of their time, where in reality, they're only working at about 5% on those. And the biggest differential here is the physical fitness end of things. And this is coming to Paddy's question in there. So the perceived importance, the lads reckon is 10%, but the actual time because of primarily the gym sessions based around the full team training is working out at 35%. So when you see that end as a coach, what, how are you interpreting those numbers? The way, the way that I would look at it is, is the core skills, obviously, is your pitch-based pitch based decisions uh, of what you're actually meant to be doing day in, day out when you're, on the, when you're on the training field. So for me, everything the boys have said there would be kind of correct. I would actually say it probably should be a wee bit higher. Um, actual time spent doesn't surprise me because we don't actually look at the goalkeeping position in a specialised position. They're incorporated at everything within the, within the training session itself. So they're pulled the games, they probably maybe have to do some running within the session as well. So it's kind of, uh, it makes a lot of sense in what they've said. The, the football part of the session is kind of, it, it's kind of, for me, it should be something that should be done an awful lot more. I think they should be put into games, maybe two goalkeepers marking each other in games as well. Again, it's very good for their first touch. It's very good for their skills in open play. The more than what Craig said there, coming out the field, it's very important where we're making an extra man now delivering the ball up the field as well. The physical fitness one, uh, for me, obviously, with two hats on here, for me, I think it's a very, very important part because if the goalkeeper isn't able to get up and down or hasn't that aerobic uh, response in their body to keep getting up, <coughs> it, it would, it, it, they're not going to be able to get up and to make that maybe second or third save within the session of what they're trying to do. So for me, with hours put in the gym, I would separate that really. So your, your gym sessions for me would be based around uh, a lot of very power-based work, uh, a lot of reactive stuff, a lot of plyometric stuff. So a lot of uh, uh, base training have been really, really powerful athlete because goalkeepers are athletes to make the saves that they have to get up and down on that as well, you know? And in the, both myself and yourself were vertically challenged when we were playing. And when you end up in Crow Park or the provincial venues and even our, our county grounds where the crossbar is the true height of eight foot as opposed to some grounds where they might only be six and a half foot. But that can be a real challenge as well for a goalkeeper to be able to get those balls that are dropping high and have confidence in taking them um, with good clean hands. So very important about that whole power there as well and strength taking a ball from a, a standing jump. Yeah, hugely. And it would have been a thing that John Morrison would have done a lot when with my time when he was there with Leitrim as well, of actually doing a lot of push-ups on your fingers and uh, strengthening up that finger part of the of the, of the uh, body as well, which people forget about. It's very, very important, leaving your hands soft, making sure you have the power in the legs. You were saying, well, we weren't the biggest in the world, but we were able always seem to get up to the crossbar, uh, unlike the pair of boys. But Again, that powerful athlete is very, very important. So the ability to make the save, make the next save and get up the ground and possibly make the third save, which is really, really important. And that reflex action of maybe getting the hand out with the foot or with the, the hand and tipping it over the bar is very, very important as well. So for me, there has to be a strength base, obviously, early season, but everything else is power based. So it's plyometrics, the ability to jump, to be able to be ballistic, being able to push that ball away and being strong on the upper body uh, and and the, the quads and the, the glutes, to be honest, Damien, you know. And end of when the, the panel is doing their mass runs and, you know, whatever their 15, 20 second intervals or whatever it is, and they're doing their, their straight runs, 150 metres or whatever, what should a goalkeeper be doing when the outfielders are doing that type of conditioning? Well, early season, I have no problem with the goalkeepers doing a wee bit of that. Um, not doing it all, but doing a wee bit of it because it's good to get a good aerobic base in and it's good as, as part of team morale as well, Damien, that they're working. But for me, it's to get up and get down, get up and get down, get up and get down, consistently working. So again, if the boys are working for 40 seconds on their maz, we should be making saves on our maz 40 seconds, up and down, up and down within that period of time as well. So come close to the games, obviously, it's an awful lot less, so it's an awful more, more reactive um, and one-off saves and then maybe getting up for the second one. But early season is very, very important that they're working at that uh, high aerobic and anaerobic uh, pace that the boys will be doing in the session. And if you ask any outfield player to go and do a goalkeeping session, 
after five minutes, they're panting. They're on their feet. They're not able to get up. They're not able to get down. And everybody's smiling on the call, but it's the truth. They can all think they can play in goals, but they don't train like it. So it's a very, very individual thing. And for club coaches as well, it's very, very important to train different than the, than the boys out the field. Quads and glutes really exploding. Absolutely burning. But also the lungs, when they just can't get up and make that second or third save, Damien, is very, very important, you know? Uh, thanks, Enda. Paddy, I'll come back to you. And I just want to talk about decision-making. And is it conscious, unconscious, instincts, and how do you train for it? Because decision-making, one of the, the hardest things to train for, but one of the things that you will really get judged on. Yeah, um, decision-making is a very hard one, Damien. Like, it's... it's you know it's just in the moment sort of stuff like um obviously playing for so long and like when Gavin has played for so long we can we can relate to scenarios that can happen in games and where the ball will come from and what can happen and get used to making them kind of little little small handed saves like where the ball is nearly just at your elbow like and you're just getting your hand out nice and quick like you know it, it's it's really all in the moment and like people say you can't train decision making but you can you know, like if, if you're playing long enough, you, you've you nearly made a save in every angle of the goals or you've conceded a goal in every angle of the goals or you've covered every angle of the goals. So like decision making is, is a lot like it just if it happens in a game, you, you train it, you train it like, you know, so you're standing at one post and balls are going to the back post and you're just getting getting around to, to cover your area and the whole lot. Like decision making can be like 45, ball dropping in. Does the midfielder go? Do you go? Have you spoke about it before the game? Have you spoke about it when he comes in on the line with you? Like, you know, you have to you have to be be ready for it and be on top of it before it happens as well. Yeah, great, Paddy. Super answers there. And just two little things that I would have used during my time is um, the kid that is learning to walk. The kid that can only learn to walk is because they can see somebody else doing it. So something I would have done a lot of is just driving in the car or in bed at night before you go to sleep is imagining making these saves, seeing somebody out the field, taking a shot going somewhere and feeling what the body was going to do to get into that position to make those saves. Because goalkeepers very seldom react to where the ball is going, especially at inter-county level. The, the forwards are too good to be able to react to where the ball is going. They have to judge by body language and shape and get a feel and a sense for where the ball is going. And the other one I used to do as well, when we're getting back to mistakes or otherwise, but if a goal went in, whether I should have saved it or not, once the ball was down the other end of the field, I used to take 10 seconds to replay that goal in my mind and just see what I would have done different. Would I have came earlier? Would I have moved left, right? What could I have done? And potentially I wouldn't save it the second time, but I gave myself a chance at doing it. And then that was it. That's how I moved on from from that incident. Once I had replayed it in my head, I was ready to move on. Um, Craig, I want to come back to you now on advice, and I'll touch in with both lads as well on this one. Advice to clubs about developing a goalkeeper from a young age. So at what age do you think it should start and what process should a club do to get a goalkeeper? I uh, I done um, a webinar myself there on on Monday night, and I would have sent out. Paddy would have filled out a link. I would have sent out to the GPA about um, just asking questions to the current intercounty goalkeepers about when they started and so on, like loads of different questions. But one of them come up was the majority of them didn't really didn't really um, fully take on to be a goalkeeper until they were maybe sixteen plus. Um, but for myself personally, I, I like. I can't, I just can't explain how, how important it is that a Gaelic goalkeeper almost can move like a, an outfield player. Their skill levels are at the same level as an outfield player. So over over them, them years from maybe from when they start up till maybe 14, that they are playing as outfielders. They understand how to play as outfielders. Their, their skill levels are at the same level as an outfielder. But I did make a point the other night in saying that club club coaches, why not take 10 minutes out of a session and allow the full team to take part in 10 minutes or 15 minutes of Gaelic goalkeeping, be it kicking off a cone, be it shot stopping, be it something fun. Now, I know myself with um, 
coaching goalies, like it's very easy to make the session enjoyable and competitive between two lads or three lads, very easily done. So there's no reason why you can't take 10 or 15 minutes out of a session once every three weeks to introduce young players to the goalkeeping scene. Because a lot of them, as I said in the in the, in the the uh, questionnaire I give out, a lot of them didn't realise they were goalkeepers until they were 16 plus because of maybe an injury to the keeper that was already there that might have been maybe possibly too heavy to play a field and he was just there from a young age and all of a sudden he's injured. And then, oh, we'll throw this fella in. And that was his first experience of... GA goalkeeper. So why not introduce young players to different elements of goalkeeping? And who knows, they might just take it up. Because I know now, I, well, I feel now goalkeeping is more attractive now than it was when I was eight, nine, ten years of age. Thanks, Craig. And uh, anything else to add to that? No, I, I probably uh, agree with what Craig says about, about letting fellas play out the field for a little bit as well. It, it certainly does help, but if there is fellas in the club that want to play in goals, that's where you need to actually start training that from a very young age and getting that enjoyment. I think there's a fear factor with young fellas in goals that if I drop the ball, the manager's going to give out to me or it's going to hit me and it's going to be sore. So no more than what Craig said, you should be, it should be very enjoyable. Um, but even if fellas playing soccer in the schoolyard, everybody wants to be in goals now. You know, they all want to play in goals because, as Craig said, it's a very, very... Uh, Nice position to play in now. There's, there's, there's kind of the likes of Stephen Cluxton and, and all these goalkeepers making it a, a, a place that is going to be very enjoyable and there's, it's a higher profile than it used to be as well. But I would kind of say, if there is a kid in the club that wants to play in goals, start training them from a young age and get everybody involved in it. I, I just think it's vital because it's not a tough thing. You have to. It's a very specialised position. And you need fellas that want to play in goals. You just can't put a fella in goals because if he's just going to stand there, he's going to be of no benefit to anybody. And the importance of the position now is just critical. We'll say from under 14, under 15, under 17 up. Like it's just it's the winning and losing of an awful lot of games, you know. And then the, you know, it's a it's a common thing that's said a lot is that you know it's a particular type of a kid is put into goals because they can't play anywhere else. So how can we flip that around for a manager that? Okay, we can address the goalkeeping position in a correct way. Get a like a somebody who has real potential to get on and play well and establish themselves there. But the person that maybe they were thinking of sticking in the, sticking them into the goals, how can that kid be incorporated in the outfield stuff to make sure that that kid can enjoy their GA experience? Well, again, you're looking at your small side of games, Damien. You're looking at playing playing games within the sessions that they're going to enjoy, like and, and marking somebody of their own ability. But then what you're looking to do is that in some of the sessions, you just take them away and you do a bit of goalkeeping work. And then you incorporate them back into the session if you want with maybe two or three other fellas. Like you have to be very wary of the ability now and, and kids' mindsets of like if they don't like something, the chances are they're not going to come back. So it's very, very important that they are incorporated in the full session to do the warm-up, to do their skills work. Then they might do a small game and then you take them out or your selector takes them out and does a bit of work. We'll see it under 12 or under 14 or under 13 or whatever the case may be. So it's about being very cognitive and being conscious of what you want to get out of the fella that you're going to put in goals or the potential fella you're going to put in goals and that he's going to play a bit of ball as well, you know? Yeah. Personally, I'd love to see an approach where, where teams were, if they had 12 games in the season, that they use six goalkeepers or four goalkeepers. So six lads played two matches or four lads played three matches throughout the year. And that maybe the strength of your team was only ever at 90% or 95%, um, but that there was always a lad that was 16 or 17 on your panel would get a start in every game, um, as opposed to those lads only coming on if if um, matches were decided one way or the other towards the end. Um, no, I, I, I don't, I'd actually go one step forward in that, Damien. I'd actually make sure everybody had a go and goals. Well, I don't know the 12 or the 13. Let them play. That's what I'd say, you know. Let them all have a go at it. And even in challenge matches or whatever the cases will be, and you can see what your potential from your goalkeepers are then. Great stuff. Um, Paddy, we're going to come back to you now. We're, we're going to hit some quick answers and we'll wrap this up in, in a few minutes. Um, I would just want to know a little bit about your gear. If anybody seen me tweet earlier, um, <laughs> Paddy sent me a photo about the boot room out the back and he had 30 pairs of boots hanging up on coat hangers. <laughs> um, what are you wearing at the minute? You're a big Adidas man. Big Adidas man, Damien. Um, I've gone, gone big. Nice. 
they're a bit out there. Um, I start buying boots that I'm going to wear for the year, so I'll buy a league boot and a championship boot. So I'll try and have one that'll be a mole and one that'll be a stud. Um, but I'm a big Adidas boot, big predator. I have a few of the the power swerve boots that I'm afraid to wear anymore because they're so valuable. But um, yeah, the boot the boots are a big thing, I guess. Three, four, five pairs a year, I could maybe. Um, and the more than what you used to do when you were playing, I I get the names on them. So I do get uh, number one and I get hashtag number three. So I had a close friend a couple of years ago that uh, died with that adult death syndrome. So he used to always play fullback and all them good teams that I played on. So I did put the number three on the boots for the start of the year. Um, the boot, the boots is massive though. Uh, when I play, do you want to know about the gloves? Yeah, well, look, I'll just touch on the boots there again for a second, Paddy. Um, the... What people don't realise, I had a question here earlier and I, I didn't ask it because I knew it would come up, but these are the things that make these lads confident players. You might think it's funny, but these lads feeling really good, having a nice pair of kicks, nice pair of gloves. Paddy, you're a fan of having the, the shorts, not the traditional shorts, but having a navy pair of shorts going with the jersey. Yeah. Um, these are, you might think that this is Kim Kardashian stuff. But this is really important to, to these lads. And this is the element of madness in goalkeepers. Tell me about your gloves, Paddy. So when you were involved, Damien, you used to sort us out with the old sport gloves. So we used to wear them the whole time. But the way the the way the way game has gone and changed and with short kickouts and Craig will be able to go with this as well. Like you give a short kickout, nine out of ten, it was coming back to you with the new rule now coming in. It won't. But I felt that the big goalkeeping gloves were very awkward and I got away from them. So I went after the Murphys, just a little small outfield gloves, the Murphys. But in the last year, um, myself and another fella in the club, Emmett Noonan, have gone into selling football socks and gloves. So um, I started wearing my own brand. So it's just, uh, they're the same kind as the Murphys. They're just a normal pair of outfield gloves, uh, Empa written on them. They're blackout, so they're nothing too fancy either. And Paddy, where can anybody go to get these? You'll do them a good deal. Get them on Instagram, Damien. Any clubs that want them, there's a great deal there. Uh, 15 euro a pair for gloves and socks together, 15 euro. So it's it's well worth it. Uh, discount code DEMO might get you 2 or 3% off. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Craig, tell me about what you're wearing at the minute. Boots, gloves. Yeah, um, I don't know whether you can see. Is my camera back up and running? Yeah, you could, yeah. Real clear. Oh, so I think it's got to go in there again. But I bought a pair of... Um, I, I've always worn Adidas. The odd time I go back to Nike, but I've always been an Adidas man. I brought the old school um, Nitro Charge. It'd be very similar to Paddy. I had a f- about 40 pairs throughout the year. As I said to you earlier on in the WhatsApp, if I felt like I was playing bad, the only thing that lift me again was a bright, bright, flashy pair of boots that I can go train and I'd feel great in again. Then also I would go through and even my brother sitting across from me here, he'd give out to me the whole time. Another new pair of boots, he'd say to me. But um, I'd, I'd usually stick with Adidas and that could range from the old school Preds. I wouldn't really buy much of the new Adidas because I just think it's a bit too far out there for me. It's a bit strange looking some of the stuff. That's the, the laceless stuff, is it? Yeah, I tried it once and uh, <laughs> just didn't feel right with it, so I didn't. So I, I, have a few, uh, I have a few pairs of the laceless boots as well, Damien, so... <laughs> Uh, yeah, lovely for the summer. Ball just springs off with the brand new O'Neills. Yeah, brand new O'Neills. Only wear them in Crow Park or something if you and, get up there. And <laughs> you remember uh, Declan O'Keefe from Kerry went barehanded. So yeah. like, that's not that long ago. Yeah. He was. No. Yeah. That, 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 um, that's, so, come, that's come back in the 90s, Damo. That's when we were really proper goalkeepers back then, you know? Yeah. <laughs> what was your kicks of choice, Enda? Oh, again, Adidas Predator would have been a big one, and I would have been a massive fan for the gloves of uh, finger saves. I would have always used them, whether it was Adidas or whether it was actually some of the other companies that I would have done. But big thing, uh, I would be using uh, Seismic now, uh, with still playing a wee bit of junior and stuff like that at home, and still using the, the Seismic finger saves. I just felt they were more comfortable on their hand, and as well, it just meant that the fingers won't come back uh, and there's a good protection for them. So I like the actual finger savers and um, I'd recommend them to a lot of the young keepers as well. Uh, we'll right. around there again, Enda. We'll stay with you, but uh, tea of choice at the minute. What are you? What would you be using yourself or what are you recommending? Oh, your use? Just, just, an, just an owl cone, Demo. Just an owl cone. That's all we're at. Let's the stay, 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 
Oh, I can trim it usually, uh, not as high as it was, but usually trim it a wee bit. Yeah, Paddy, what are you working off? I'm still working, Damien, off uh, the one that Gary Matthews gave us back in maybe 2012. Do you remember he said it was yeah. like a, a cut out from the old Astras? Yeah, the upside so down Astra. The upside down Astra. I think the, the Green Ball Company have a smaller version of it again, which I have that, but I can't get into that at the minute. I'm still using the one from back then. Yeah, they still have the two sizes. They have the smaller size and the, the, the regular size there as yeah. well. And Craig, what are you kicking off? Um... It just depends on the weather, I suppose. Sometimes I like to go back to just straight off the grass. If um, the style of play we're going with is short kickouts, I go straight off the grass. But um, usually just the old training cones where I'd cut them back and if maybe two or three different sizes, depending on, you know, when you go to a pitch and some grass could be very long, you know, I'd, I'd stick to a higher cone so the ball's not coming off it. But just the standard cone that you cut back. Yeah, that's it. It, the difference between intercounty uh, football and club football is the quality of the pitch. And to be a, generally nearly every intercounty game, other than potentially some of the league matches, you can kick off the grass. But when you're going to club venues and the the whole 21 or 13 is all wiped out with sand or divots or whatever, um, really important that you have a tee that will stand up and, and stabilise the ball. And again, that your goalkeeper is really comfortable with. And uh, um, what really gets your goat up? What annoys you? Uh, a couple of things actually that I'm, I'm based on at the minute. Uh, if a team loses, it's basically they're not fit enough and it was the goalkeeper's fault. They are two things that just drive me insane. You're facing the front of both of them. I am, yeah. Um, but I just I just think it's crazy. Like um, no matter it doesn't matter what level they're at. If <laughs> if something happens, the goalkeeper didn't do it, didn't kick it out, uh, went over his head or he slapped it down or something like that happened. The fellas out the field could do it 40 times, and that's nothing said about that. And then the big thing is that they're, they're not fit enough. They keep chasing after the ball. They keep doing whatever they're doing. But, yeah, they're not talking about the 20 times to give it away out of about a percentage of 22% in the scoring zone. So they are my big two, uh, always have been and always will be. Yeah, it's a question I asked Park Davis in the first of her interviews is, does the spectator actually understand the game that he's involved in at inter-county level? And... There is a bit of a disconnect there with what an intercounty team is trying to do or what's going on and the level of understanding. And it's not helped by the analysts that are on TV and picking out those sensational stuff and not really grilling into the game. Uh, Paddy, what gets your goat up? Be something similar to end of Damien. Um, people, you know, they they don't want to talk about the good days in the past. They want to talk about the bad days, the the mistakes, the defeats. You know, they don't want to talk about like. Oh, Longford won in the Baron Cup, but Longford lost such a league game. You know, the the back up a positive with a with a mistake, like or something. I just it really it, I just can't understand. Like it, like we're all we're all together. Like and and Longford say it's the same in Leitrim and same in, in Loud. Like it's nearly like say one good thing and two bad things and move on. Like it should be nearly three good things and leave it at that. Like. Yeah, it's a little bit in the, the Irish nature again, isn't it, about yeah. that whole sort of slagging or that they think is harmless slagging and you think that it's great crack. Um, it's not. <laughs> Craig, what gets your goal? <laughs> um, I think the two Johnny's done a bit in this. It's it's kind of like them, that club fan that stands at the same spot at the wall at every game and any time the goalkeeper gets the ball, all he wants you to do is kick it as far down the field as you possibly can. <laughs> So it's there's this one man in particular. Any time I do get the ball in club football, he's the only person I seem to hear lately. It would be just give the ball or kick the ball or what's that easy doing going past the twenty one yard line or and, and and he little does he know that maybe your manager's asking you to do this or as soon as the ball goes into the full back line, your full backs the first reaction they do is give you the ball. But you always get that header that's behind the wall that just he's about to take a stroke or a heart attack as soon as he sees the goal yes. passing the twenty one yard line. <laughs> that could be one of the fellas you might hit with one of those straight kickouts early in the game. <laughs> um, just a rapid fire, lads. We're looking for some reactions here. I'm going to call you out some names. Um, Craig, I'm going to give you first crack at these. So we go Craig, Enda, and Paddy. So Conor McGregor, Craig, you're up. I love him. Je- absolute hero. Enda, go on ahead. Controversial. Paddy. Yeah, made his money. Mary Lou, Craig. I wouldn't care a whole pile for the lady. Go on ahead, Edna. No comment. 
Same as that, Damien, no comment. <laughs> uh, sitting on the fence, lads. He's get blisters. Uh, Michael O'Leary. Is he, if he's watching, could I do a few um, free tickets? Get out of Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> Go on ahead, Le- Legend. Legend. Yeah. Not for me either. Afraid of flying, Damien. Joe Brawley, Craig. Uh, hugely controversial, but interesting. Enjoyable. Very interesting. Donald Trump. Fishbowl. <laughs> Fool. Hey, kiss. Roy Keane. Absolute hero. Greatest Irish soccer player. Competitor. Legend. Greatest ever United player. Bono. Who? <laughs> Bono. I think he's enough said there. I don't have much time for that man. I, I'd, I'd agree. Tax exile comes to mind. Only ever really seen him in South Park. <laughs> <laughs> uh, love Island, Craig. I'd love to be there. Addictive. Have been made watch it all. Oh, I'm sure you have. <laughs> <laughs> First to the remote control. <laughs> um, Craig, we'll stay in the same order, lads. So, Craig, mess I just think it's interesting, Damien, that Paddy says he's made watch it. For anyone that stood beside Paddy, I find it very hard to believe that somebody has made Paddy watch something. <laughs> that beard would surely be gone if somebody had that influence on him. <laughs> uh, Craig, Messi or Ronaldo? Neither. David Beckham. Stop. Oh, will you stop? Messi. Ronaldo. 99 or a Canetto? 99. 99. 99 had one this evening. O'Gara or Sexton? O'Gara. Sexton. O'Gara. Cats or dogs? Dogs. 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 Chicken burger or beef burger? Beef burger. Chicken burger. Turkey burger. I <laughs> <laughs> love that one. Crafts <laughs> or chess? I'm not sure if goalkeepers should be answering this question now. You might I need to know what either. either game is. None for me. Don't know how to play either of them. Drafts. Drafts. Yeah, and you'd never find a goalkeeper saying chess now. No. Uh, 25 or poker? This is probably more in your line. Poker. 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 Darts or pool? Darts. Darts. Pool. And last one. Hat or not on a sunny day? No hat. Hat. Hat every day. <laughs> so, Craig, tell me why no hat. Uh, uh, no matter what you do, you still look up into the sun like if the high ball's coming in, so the hat doesn't necessarily block you. I wore it once there last year in the Antrim beat us, and I ended up fracturing my thumb. I come on for the last 10 minutes, and I ended up fracturing my thumb, so I said never again. D- Damien. Paddy. Yeah, we uh, we played Dublin in I think it was two or three years ago, and Paddy Power tweeted. I had to put a hat on a half time or before half time. Paddy Power tweeted saying, "Hey, uh, the lot fair play at for goalkeeper. He is the head of a fella going in there with a pig cap that looks like he's going to have a pint at half time." And with the way the whole thing was going, it probably wouldn't have been a bad shot. <laughs> <laughs> and Paddy, just on a serious note, is the hat wearing? because you think that people feel you should be wearing it or you actually see benefit to it? Um, bit of both, Damien. So some days the sun will be the right height that, you know, the hat, you don't, it, it just stops you from holding the hand up yeah. when the ball isn't even down your end of the field. Um, but as what Craig said, hat is very, it's, it's useless in the sense that when you look up, you know, you're seeing stars as it is like so. Yeah. But like I I I go with the hat it all depending on how high or how low the sun is for most of the game. Yeah, just for resting the arm more than anything else. More or less, yeah. Yeah. Lads, excellent. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed tonight. Um it was great talking about a position that um lots of people probably don't understand fully. Hopefully we gave you some insights into the potential to work with young goalkeepers within your clubs and maybe more so what's going on inside the mind of a goalkeeper and how you might be able to get the best out of them. Uh, Thanks very much again tonight, lads, for your contribution. And uh, we wish you all the best of luck. Hopefully you get back playing ball 
this summer and you can have there could be uh there could be not a handy there's no handy anything's ever won but there could be some ver- big surprises this year with what teams do well in in championships so we wish you all the very best of luck and uh, we'll see you very soon thanks everybody for joining us thank you cheers lads thanks a million bye-bye